Today's lecture is all about art elements and design principles. The art elements are as follows. Line, texture, space, shape or form, value, and color. I have a daughter who used to like to make brownies. When she was your age, and as a junior and a senior, she made brownies many, many times. And she said to me, actually said this to me, Mother, it stifles my creativity to follow a recipe. And so rather than follow a recipe, she'd wing it every time she made the brownies. And once in a great while, we would have the most wonderful brownies on the planet. And everybody would be saying, oh, do these again, do these again. Well, she couldn't because she really had no idea how she got there. And for every time we got the beautiful, wonderful brownies, there were probably 10 times that we had really awful brownies. For example, one time she forgot the sugar, or more than once. And so they were like bitter chocolate biscuits. Not very good. Uh, another time she put in, that I remember, way too much butter. And so what we had was chocolate sludge. Tasted good, but you had to eat it with a spoon and never did bake. There were times when she didn't put in enough flour or she put in too much flour. We just never knew from one time to the next what we were going to get because there was no planning and no real organization. Eventually, it came to a point where even she probably realized that the only way to get a resu reliable result is to follow kind of a recipe. I want you to think about art elements as if they're the recipe for a good pot. So you might have three parts line, one part texture, five parts color, etc., etc. Properly combining the art elements as your ingredients will create the following design principles in your piece. Point of emphasis, echoing, rhythm, good proportion, balance, and the end result that we all want is harmony or unity. The first art element we're going to talk about is line. A line is the identifiable path of a point moving in space. It can vary in width, direction, and length. That's a definition for line. But more importantly, we want to look at how line is used in real artworks. So let's take a look. Now I'd like to show you some examples of how various potters have put line into their pieces. This first one is what you would call slip trailing. Rose Burns made these plates so that the slip trail design reads across all five plates. And those of you who can't read it, I'll read it for you. It says, never got close to the meal itself, but these pots was there. Wild Rose Burns, burned them good. All Rose did was take thickened clay slip, put it in a squirt bottle with a narrow tip, and trail a design of slip across all five plates. Another way you can put line into your pieces is actually by adding foreign objects after the firing. In this case, the only ceramic parts are the beads, the head and the hands and the feet. The line is created by stringing the beads on wire and by creating wire trees. Now it feels like someone is in a winter scene, perhaps ice skating. As you see the winter trees. Now this artist created line by taking a broken comb and combing the wet clay. 
Then after the bisque fire, they used a body stain down in those combed textures, glazed the surface of the pot with a light glaze, the body stain bleeds through, creates the line. One of my favorites are these, uh, this teapot and, and uh, mug set by a British artist. Here I believe what he's done is tape resist. There are a number of ways it could have been done. But look at these beautiful lines on this piece. My favorite is the teapot where he's actually drawn an abstract line drawing of a teapot on the teapot. Now here we've got an artist who has taken two slabs and attached one over the other. The one on the top, they've rolled the back veins of some leaves right into the slab. Now most of us, I think, if we were attaching one slab to another, we would have done it just straight on straight. And then the edges, where those shadows are at the connection, would have just been straight black lines. But this is an example of what I would call calligraphic line from the word calligraphy, which has to do with beautiful writing. In this case, can we make beautiful line in our pieces? I know an artist who uh, one year said to me, and he is a rom what I would call a romantic uh, landscape painter, oil painter, and he said to me, my goal for this year is to create more calligraphic line in my work. Now what does he mean? Does he mean the tree limbs are going to undulate and bend around or something? No, he just means that each time he does line, he wants curves that are kind of uh, opposing each other and making really pretty lines, not just straight, all parallel lines. Now, I've never cared for this one a great deal, but it does show some other ways that you can create line in a piece. In this case, they have actually folded the clay and stained it to create line. They've also done some texture. It looks like maybe they took a roller. Can you see the dots that, that kind of follow up in a row? And if you look really close, right in the middle, can you see that photo in the center? Uh, there is actually a technique called photo glaze where you can actually add photographs to, to clay and fire it in a kiln. Now this is one of my favorite pieces. This one, uh, the underlying glaze is actually uh, stoneware. The pale gray-green and the pale brown on the lip are the high-fire glaze. And then the red, the pinstripe yellow, the rusty, uh, the russet color, and the um, black on the peacock feather are all done by overglaze. Now most of us, if somebody said, I want you to design a pot with a peacock feather on it. Most of us would paint the peacock feather. This is an extremely sophisticated way to do this piece. They didn't paint the feather, they painted around it. They painted the negative space and allowed the feather to emerge in the space. It's really a beautiful way to do it. And if you'll notice up on that upper left edge, there's another one wrapping around the other side. There's actually three of them because an artist doesn't just work on the front. We work all the way around. Now changing the surface uh, quality of the piece from smooth to rough or bumpy is creating texture. Now this can be done a number of ways. You can do it by carving, slip trailing, adding clay, etc. I love this one. In this one, the artist took a wheel thrown bowl off a potter's wheel and while it was wet, they've warped it. Then they've created a sculpture that fits down in that warped area and makes it look like the bowl is bending as the lizard climbs out of it. 
which gives us a feeling of movement and life to this piece. Look at the texture on this little guy. It is exquisite. I can think of a number of ways they could have done it. They could have taken a sgraffito tool, carved around each little lizard bump, and then smoothed it. They could, I know an artist who did this second way, and that was he was doing a sculpture of a rhinoceros, and he wanted that leathered, bumpy hide for his sculpture, and so he took a little piece of plaster and carved little divots in it. And then when he stamped that on his sculpture, it created little raised bumps all over the skin. A third way you could do it would be if you actually owned a lizard, take a soft piece of clay, press it on their skin, bisque fire the clay, and you've got a little stamp that you can use on your sculpture. This is really a great piece. Now this beautiful uh, yellow bottle by artist Cliff Lee is uh, really a great example of ways that you can add texture. Notice in the neck of the bottle and up there are tiny, tiny little white spikes. And then in the body of the pot, he's done some carving, so you almost get these like pumpkin sort of curves and lines. Now the white spikes at the top are actually white because glaze won't stick to sharp edges, and that yellow glaze is actually kind of peeled back a little bit from the porcelain clay, leaving those little white spikes. Uh, those would be really tedious to apply, but Gosh, he's got really gorgeous texture on this, doesn't he? This plate is by Elaine Coleman. As you start learning to glaze, you'll find that we have an Elaine Celadon glaze in the, in the glaze room. We also have uh, several Tom Coleman glazes, like uh, Coleman's Vegas Red. As we look at these things, the reason those glazes are in there is because Tom and Elaine Coleman are famous American potters. In this one, Elaine Coleman has created texture by carving into the surface of a wheel-thrown porcelain plate. The raised areas, when sprayed with a dark green see-through or transparent glaze, show up as lighter in color. And so the recessed or the carved-in lines collect more glaze and come out darker. So carving is another way to create texture just like Cliff Lee did in the yellow pot. Now here's a cylinder slab where somebody has taken a cylinder and they have actually carved with a ribbon tool right into it and created a very interesting texture. It's more fun to look at than a simple can shape out of clay. This piece by J.T. Brown has texture created in three different ways that I can see. The handle, I believe, is probably by taking a skinny rope and wrapping it around a coil and rolling it slightly. That creates that dented spiral texture on the handle. The lip is a slab that's been carved and folded and scored and slipped on. On the body of the pot, I can see a lot of slip trailing and some little places where I think they've actually added little bits of clay design. Gephardt's pieces remind me of a person in a robe, just missing the head and the hands. Um, in this one, which is basically a modified cylinder slab, she's taken a, her square-ended ribbon tool and carved this design all over the front and the back of this piece. So again, carving is one of the best ways to create texture, and the others are to add clay. Here's another piece by Cliff Lee. Uh, this is a traditional style in Chinese uh, pottery to carve it into a flower shape like a chrysanthemum or into a, a cabbage head shape or something like that. Now here you have two actual wheel thrown pots, the base and the pot itself. They've been scored and slipped together and then the base has been carved into uh, cabbage leaves and the top has been carved into a head of cabbage. It's really beautifully done. Now one of the more important art, art elements in my mind is having great negative space. And the definition of negative space is that it's the shape of the space around the object. 
So let's look at this pot. This pot is a drape mold. Uh, you can see where the two halves were put together. You can see that you can do some really creative things with drape molds. Now the definition of negative space or good negative space is this. First we're going to draw an imaginary box around the object or the pot. Next we're going to look at the shape of the spaces created after we drew that box. As we look at those space shapes, are they varied and interesting? This is really critical. We don't want plain, same, everywhere spaces. So if the spaces are varied and interesting, it is considered to have good negative space. This is one of the easiest ways to create a really good looking piece. Look at ways to improve the negative space. Here we've got a pot from Central America, which I think as you look at the, the, the bowl of the body of the pot and the slight flare to the lip, that gives us some nice negative space, doesn't it? It's pleasant. But let's look at this pot the way it was really created with legs. Now look at the shape of the spaces. Can you see that simple things like adding legs to a piece immensely improve the shape of the negative space? If the negative space is varied and interesting, that means the surface of your pot, the form itself, has a more interesting shape. Another way you can create negative, negative space that's interesting and pleasing to the eye is by piercing the form. In this case, the artist has taken these little shapes and cut right through. So you can actually see through the entire pot. I'd like you to look here at a famous sculpture by Henry Moore. Henry Moore was a British sculptor who's passed away now, but he did a lot of these modern shaped figures. I saw one one time. It was in a, an indoor museum, and they had actually created a courtyard garden around it because they really wanted it to become more part of the surrounding. Look at how you can see greenery under the legs and through the arm, and this creates a way that it, it is more unified with its surrounding. So the more spaces you're creating around your piece and through your piece, the more it's going to feel harmonious with wherever it's put. I really like this piece. They've done a number of things that I think are really unique and interesting. First, this is a very sculptural form. Uh, notice how they have um, created a space. They could have put this as kind of a lid on it and done the edges of that black part straight up and down. Instead, they've tipped that black addition on the edges so that it cuts into the negative space more. In addition to that, by raising that black bar up on pegs, they've created another place that we see light, we see space around the pot. All of these things combine to create really interesting, varied, unusual negative space. That's what we're after. Now look at this sculpture. This is actually a drape mold. Can you see the body is two double drape, is uh, two drape slabs put together and the head is two drape slabs put together. Now what if they had moved the hand down on the body of the, of the figure? What if the head, the face was down on it? Can you see how then the negative space would just be straight, straight, straight? Or what if they hadn't put it up on those funny spindly legs? All of those things, the hand out in space, the face up above the edge of the pot, the legs down below creating such interesting negative space there. All of these things combine to make a much more dynamic piece. I mean, look at the shape of the negative space up above the head. It's almost like the it looks almost like the state of Montana or something. That's interesting space, and it's not the same everywhere around the pot. Now one last thing about this sculpture before we move on, and that is that this little double drape sculpture did not rest its weight on those legs until after a high fire. I guarantee you they are too spindly to have taken the weight. And so this piece probably rested on kiln posts or clay supports that were removed later on. 
Next art element that we're going to discuss is shape or form. Form is the shape of the piece in three dimensions, height, width, and depth. So if I'm talking about painting or drawing, all it has is height and width because it's flat. And so it's a two-dimensional artwork. Three-dimensional art forms are things like pottery and sculpture because they have height, width, and depth. They have three dimensions. There's a famous saying in the art world that I, that I quite like, and the saying is this, form ever follows function. Form follows function. What it means is the shape of the object is dictated by what it has to do. So let's look at these bowls. If I want to make a bowl, it's got to have slightly raised sides, right? Otherwise, the soup rolls right out on the table. It's got to have a slightly rounded bottom corner so that my spoon can get all the Cheerios out. So form, the shape of the object, the form, is determined by what that object's going to function as. Let's look at some. For example, a teapot form must have a spout to direct hot liquid a handle to protect you from burning yourself, and a body to hold the hot liquid and the lid to trap the heat inside. So we need to determine what's the purpose of the piece, and that tells us a lot about what the form is going to be. So what is the use of the piece? Because its use determines to a great extent what the shape or form is going to be. So think of it as kind of a continuum. On one end, we have total functionality. It may be ugly as sin, but it is useful. On the other hand, on the other end, we have the aesthetic value. How good looking is it? How smooth is it? How great is the negative space? Those are all the aesthetic values. In modern terms, there's also another uh, meaning to aesthetic, and that is what is its meaning. Uh, for example, I know an artist who does paintings of torture and atrocity scenes from around the world. Now, he doesn't do these paintings because they're beautiful. They aren't beautiful. They are ugly and they are hard to look at. But what he's trying to do is highlight uh, our civil rights abuses, whether they're from uh, South Africa years ago or China today. And he uses those paintings to highlight that political meaning. So his aesthetic value is political. Our aesthetic value here in this class is primarily how great looking is it. Now as we look at these two teapots, the one on the left is very functional. It's a great stoneware teapot. But as I look at it, it's really pretty good looking too, isn't it? So really it might move up the line a ways toward the aesthetic. And as I look at it some more, I can see, can you see that big pulled handle that's made out of fired clay? Well, that's not going to go upside down in my dishwasher, is it? That means this pot has to be hand washed. So that affects its, its functionality and moves it higher on the aesthetic line. On the other side, we have a pot that is very, very large. This pot is very sculptural in nature and would take probably two hands to lift it up. Does it have a spout? Yes. Does it have a lid? Yes. Handle? Yeah. So is it a teapot? Yes, it is. But it is so sculptural in nature that it is not a very functional piece. It's very high on the aesthetic end. So as you look at these, what do you think? The
the one on the left is definitely functioning very well as a chip bowl and plate, so or a salsa bowl with a chip plate. And so you could put that out and use it. It goes in your dishwasher. It's very, very functional. On the other hand, it's pretty attractive, isn't it? So you would have to move it up the line a little ways, wouldn't you? Now look at Justin Ferrari's sculpture on the right. This piece is totally aesthetic in nature. It's, by the way, it's uh, largely corner slab and a little bit of cylinder slab construction. So those are things that you're becoming familiar with. You can see that artists are using the techniques you are learning, but we are turning them into more sophisticated projects because we've had more experience. As you gain experience, you can become better at this too. Now, as we look at this piece, let's start to count up what we can see in terms of the art elements and design principles. For example, the handle has that long coil that becomes the handle. That's a line, isn't it? And the coils that are, that are attaching the handle to the lid, can you see those are lines too? Look at the throw mark lines going up the side of the wall from throwing on the potter's wheel. You can see the potter's finger marks going up the wall. There's even one little line, it's hard to see, but it's carved into the lid. So this has a lot of line. Does it have texture? A little bit. Um, you wouldn't really count the throw marks on the side because that's still largely smooth. If you felt it, it feels pretty smooth. But the coils, those rough coils uh, that are attaching the handle onto the lid, those would definitely be an example of texture. Does it have great negative space? It could have been a simple straight up and down cylinder, but it isn't, is it? I can see space under the handle and around the end of the handle. As you can see it boxed in there, look how the lid is carved so that it pokes out beyond the cylinder of the bottom of the jar. So all of these things give it better negative space, don't they? What about what kind of form is it? Is it a functional form or an aesthetic form? Or is it a combination of the two? For most of us, it's a combination. This does function as a jar. Can I store my M&Ms in it? You bet. On the other hand, do I want it out with my five-year-old grandson? Probably not. Now here we have a couple of uh, jugs that are used for storing liquid. Uh, as you look at the big one, what do you think? Is this a very aesthetic piece or a very functional piece? See, for me, it's very, very functional and not very attractive. I like the little one to its side a lot more. I, to me, that has a much nicer aesthetic value. More interesting negative space, uh, clever creation, um, moving the spout to the side and putting the handle in the middle. I like this one. But a lot of my students find the larger one to be a very aesthetic form. So there's a little bit of beauty in the eye of the beholder to this too. So it's okay if to one person this has a higher aesthetic value than it does to me. Now here we have a teapot that was made in China in the early 19th century. Now what that means is this was a functioning teapot even though it looks a little unusually shaped because the Chinese were not making teapots just to look at. They used them. Now, we have a number of places that we can see line on this piece. We can see line around the lid, can't we? Around the edge of the lid. We can see line where the handle was created out of a, a square piece of slab. Um, notice the calligraphic line under the feet. We have that shadow line created by putting that little flat foot in the corners and then slanting that foot. And then last, we can see line carved in. There's actually some Chinese characters carved into the top of the teapot. So we can see line in a number of places. Uh, does it have much texture? Not much, just a teeny bit where the lettering was carved in. Um, does it have good negative space? Well, think about it. It's not, it could have just been a corner slab, just a straight square box. But look at it. We've got the spout sticking out, the lid sticking up. 
the handle sticking out, the feet creating a slight shadow edge around the bottom. So this pot has some nice negative space. Is it a functioning piece? It is. It definitely was a functioning piece, but its aesthetic value was high. Now we're going to talk about another art element. This is the art element of value. So value refers to the degree of light and dark in a piece, and it is independent of color. For example, baby blue would be the lightest value of blue, and navy blue would be the darkest value of blue. For the greatest visual impact, always contrast your light values against your dark values. I always get beginning students who do a dark blue pot and then want to put black stain or a black glaze with it. Why? Black and blue are both dark values. It has no pizzazz, no sparkle. A better system would be do your dark blue pot and then dip the lip in marshmallow, which is a bright white. That gives you a light and dark value contrast. This is the way we want to create our pieces so that somebody walking by it, if they were just going down a, a row of museum glass cases looking at pottery, they stop and really look at something. It's largely or has a lot to do with how is the value contrast on that piece. Does it have some real spark because strong lights and strong darks will give you that. Now this pot is a double drape mold. Can you see the double drape form in the bottle? And it's a sgraffito piece. Some of you did some little extra credit bowls where you took some uh, black colored slip and painted it on and then you scratched a design in. Well, this husband-wife team uh, named Kerrigan, they do this and call these uh, spirit pots, I believe. This is white clay body with black slip and all of the little white marks are scratched into the white clay body. Now look at the great value contrast this has. This gives it terrific visual interest. Also while you're looking at this, notice the places that we see line, great negative space. It would have a teeny bit of texture because of the sgraffito carving. Now here we have a pot that not only has a lot of color, but it's got great value contrast. And here's how I believe that they did it. Now if you look down low, just above the black sooty feet, you can see kind of a light tan color. I think that's the original high fire glaze. Then they have gone in and they've painted the bright oranges, reds, yellows, uh, large, probably just in a big band across the top and then more carefully down in those two little gold bow tie shapes. Probably used stencils to paint those on with overglaze. And then they've run it through one overglaze firing. And then they have cut little tape shapes and they've taped them all off all over the place. And then they've painted a blue-black overglaze right over the tape, peeled the tape off, fired a second overglaze, and then we have bright, bright, bright value colors next to the dark blue-black background. Think about it. If all of it was bright light or all of it was dark, none of those beautiful shapes and colors would show up. It's because of the value contrast that we can see everything that's going on on this great piece. This one has great value contrast. This wasn't done through overglaze. This was glazed with a clear or a white glaze over a light colored clay body. And then the black marks, uh, the bands, and the little brush strokes all done with black stain on top of probably a white glaze. The last art element we need to talk about is the art element of color. The definition of color is kind of scientific, and the definition is that when light is reflected off of an object, color is what the eye sees. I'll give you a minute to write it down.
There are a lot of ways you can incorporate color into your piece. In this case, we're looking at high-fired stoneware clay color with no glaze. Here you can see that kind of rusty red like we had in the JSRH clay that we used to decorate our whistles. Now in this pot, which was uh, an American pottery company made this back in the uh, early 19th century, as you look at this piece, you can see that another way we can create great color in our pieces is by our glazing techniques. Now here we have an earthenware glazed vase that has very, very dark brown glaze and then splashes of bright fiery orange, red, and yellow. That value contrast gives this vase a really great sparkle. So glazing is another way to add color to your pieces. Now let's look at this one that we talked about um, in terms of value contrast a few moments ago. Now look at it in terms of the color. Great use of color. This is all over glaze. So it high fired, it bisque fired, then it high fired with a glaze on it. And then it's been through at least two low fire over glazes. Here's another great example of glazing technique. Uh, artist Tom Coleman is a, is a famous American potter. And in the back room, you'll see a glazed bucket that's called Coleman's Vegas Red. And that means it's his glaze recipe. So here you can see some, although we don't get fire engine red in high fire temperatures, we can get some great purple and, and orangey reds by our glaze. Now this is called Myolica. This is a glaze style that uh, was developed in, oh, Portugal is one of the earliest. Italy did it, so did Spain. A uh, white background with stain decoration right on top of the glaze before it fires. They usually have uh, fruit or flower themes. And this is one of the things that you can do uh, in, in high fire wear are these kind of white background with real pretty uh, loose stain decoration. Notice that the stain is kind of see-through like watercolor. We don't want to cake the stain on when we do these. We want them to be light and delicate. If you do them too heavy, it can uh, screw up your glaze, cause it to blister and get uh, bubbles in the surface, or even peel back and leave big uh, dry spots in the glaze. So, But you can do a really great job being very careful and delicate with stain. Now what we want to do is take those six art elements, the line, the texture, the color, the space, the form, the value, and we want to combine those judiciously to create the following design principles. Point of emphasis, 